Hello everyone, and welcome to the Russian Empire History Podcast, the history of all the peoples, the Russian Empire. I'm your host, J.B. Bristow. This is Season 1, The Forest, The Steppe, and the Birth of the Russian Empire. Episode 32, Imaginary Khazars, Part 1, The Thirteenth Tribe. Let me start by apologising for the delay. As I said at the end of the last episode, I was starting a new job and I had rather an erratic schedule over the initial training, which meant that I lost a couple of weeks of writing time completely. I also said that this would be a big episode, but I did not want to break it up. As it turned out, the episode came in too big to make that reasonable, around three times as long as a normal episode, so I have decided to split it into three parts which will be released part one this weekend, part two on Wednesday, and part three hopefully next weekend. After that, we will resume our normal cadence. I also need to thank my new patrons, Tamara, Kay, Johnny, Per, and Jason, and the new subscribers on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Listener David wrote to say that he listens on the website and would like to subscribe through PayPal and be able to download the member episodes to listen to without using one of the podcast apps. So if you are in a similar situation, you can now find a PayPal subscribe button on the subscriptions page of the website. And if you subscribe, I will send you a link to the episodes. So I think that most of you will be aware that Eastern Europe has historically had a large Jewish population, larger than Western Europe's. And we have been talking about a large part of Eastern Europe being ruled by the Khazars, the people that converted to Judaism, at least to some much debated extent. So some of you might have wondered, is there a connection between the Khazars and Eastern European Jews? And you would not be alone. Historians, writers, and members of various Jewish communities themselves have addressed this question over the years. In 1976, the Hungarian Jewish writer Arthur Kustler published a book called The Thirteenth Tribe. The book argued that Ashkenazi Jews, the branch of the Jewish diaspora, initially of mainly German origin, that formed across northern Europe from France to Russia, were not descended from the ancient Israelites of historical Judea, but rather from Khazars, who had migrated north after the collapse of the Khanate. This was not a new idea that he had just come up with. It had previously been discussed by scholars such as Douglas Morton Dunlop, a British professor of history at Columbia University who was the leading Western scholar of the Khazars in his day, as well as Jewish scholars in Europe and Israel. Rather, Kerstler was aiming to present the theory to a popular audience in order to undermine anti-Semitism by demonstrating that it had no racial basis, or as he put it, to refute the popular belief in a Jewish race descended from the biblical tribe. While scholars such as Dunlop and other historians had presented claims about the relationship between the Khazars and modern Jews as unproven possibilities, Kerstler presented them as fact. He told many people he discussed the work with that if he could prove that Eastern European Jews were descended from the Khazars, the racial basis for anti-Semitism would be removed, and anti-Semitism itself would disappear. As a Hungarian Jew, he also believed that there was some kind of special ancient affinity between his compatriots and the Khazars. In one sense, the book was a success. Looking at Amazon as I write this, it is ranked number one in the history of Judaism and number 38 in European history. Solid results for a 50-year-old book. It has a thousand reviews, and an average score of 4.7. On the other hand, I probably don't need to tell you that anti-Semitism is still with us, 
perhaps even undergoing something of a resurgence. The book received a mixed reaction. Critics panned it, including even his own biographers. It was not published in Israel for years, and for some it even had the opposite effect to his intentions. The Saudi Arabian delegate to the United Nations said that Kostler's work negated Israel's right to exist if the Ashkenazi Jews were not descended from the Israelites and were not even Semites, they could have no historical claim to Israel or any land promised in the Bible. Kostler didn't agree with this view, as he felt that the Jews' right to Israel was based on the United Nations, not covenants with God or genetics. Some neo-Nazis also liked the book, thinking that it justified their own beliefs about Jews. The Khazar theory of Jewish origins had, in fact, already been used by anti-Semites even before the 13th tribe, something which Kostler simply ignored. We haven't spent much time on Jews yet in this podcast, and there are good reasons for that. We still haven't reached the period in which major Jewish communities form, and some of the main areas of Jewish settlement will not become part of the Russian Empire until much later in our story. So I think it's worth taking a quick look at some of the different communities that Kostler tried to link to the Khazars. Ashkenazi Jews emerged in the Holy Roman Empire. If you've listened to the members episode on early Poland, you'll know about the German colonization of Poland, and many Jews joined that migration from German territory to the east. The Czech Jews formed around the same time in Moravia and Bohemia, and also took part in this movement eastwards. Later, Sephardic Jews joined, and Jews from Byzantium also moved north. Conditions were conducive and successful communities were formed in any number of cities across Eastern Europe. In the second half of the 17th century, the migratory drift started to tend back towards the West, culminating in the mass migration of East European Jews to the United States and Canada in the late 19th and early 20th century. I should probably note quickly here that even those of these notable Jewish communities that were in the Russian Empire were not in Russia itself. Jews were not allowed in Muscovy. Later rulers like Peter I and Catherine II were open anti-Semites who confined Jews to the Pale of Settlement, an area outside of the Russian heartland. The main Jewish communities of the Russian Empire were in Ukraine, Poland and the Baltic region. It was only after 1917 that Jews were able to live across Russia. So let's look at some of those communities. Ashkenazi Jews were not all originally from German territory. There were communities of Slavic-speaking Jews in the East that adopted the Yiddish language and Ashkenazi religious practices, resulting in the development of a more homogenous Eastern European Jewish culture by the modern era. Before that happened, there were Slavic-speaking Jewish communities, for example, in Rus. At one time, there was a widespread assumption that these Jewish communities grew out of the remnants of Khazars who came under Rus rule. This theory was supported by a handful of documents concerning Jews in Kiev, such as the Kievan letter that we've referenced in earlier episodes. However, other historians argue against this. While some of the names of the signatories on the Kievan letter are claimed to have Turkic origins, others do not show any connection, and it's possible that they were Jews who moved to Kiev from Byzantium due to trade. There are some Jewish records from Thessaloniki that refer to Jewish elders from Kiev attending an assembly to discuss the Karaite Jews, and to Jews travelling from Kiev to Thessaloniki to meet relatives in their historical homeland. At least one of these Jews did not speak Greek, Hebrew or Aramaic, and the preponderance of evidence is that they spoke East Slavic as their native tongue. Medieval records of Jews in Rus and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania showed that they had Slavic names. 
Some historians have still argued that they were of Khazar origin, but if they were, why did we not see Turkic-speaking Jews with Turkic or Turkicized Hebrew names? Czech Jews moved east, fleeing the First Crusade. They show up in the records thanks to their West Slavic names, and some of them have acquired the surname of Czech. German Jews, as I already noted, moved eastward as part of the official policies supporting colonization in Poland. They enjoyed favorable rights there compared to much of Europe. In 1264, Bolesław V granted Jews the right to practice Judaism, the right to travel freely, to worship in a synagogue, to trade freely, and to own property, as well as other rights. These groups eventually adopted Yiddish and transformed into the Jewish culture of Eastern Europe. There's no evidence that they descended from the Khazars, although some suggest that Turkic-derived words in Yiddish were acquired through intermarriage between these communities and Khazarian Jews. However, this is unlikely to be the case. Some historians have even argued that there are no Turkish words in Yiddish even the ones that can be given the Turkic derivation, were already borrowed into Slavic languages before Yiddish developed. Words like kaftan for the long step garment, baraban or drum, and kamish or rush can still be found in modern Slavic languages and most likely reached Yiddish from there rather than a Turkic source. In 1492, the Jews were expelled from Spain followed by Portugal in 1497. They moved around the world, across the Mediterranean, to England, Germany, even Mexico. But some also moved to Eastern Europe, meaning that there were now also communities of Sephardic Jews living in places such as Gdansk. Again, we have no reason to see a Khazar connection here, which further undermines any idea that the Eastern European Jews were descended from the Khazars. I've previously mentioned that there was a Jewish migration from the Byzantine Empire into Khazaria after the adoption of Judaism. These Jews were known as Romaniotis. According to the Israeli classicist Daniel Gershenson, Ashkenazi Jews have traditionally used Byzantine liturgical hymns not used by any other Jewish community, especially those by a poet named Eliezer Hakalia as well as other phrases that Ashkenazi share with Greek-speaking Jews, but not other communities. Eliezer Hakalir was one of the first Jewish hymn writers, and he is known for his distinct and influential style based on Biblical Hebrew. Gershenson speculated that this was due to Romaniote Jews migrating north from their home in Khazaria, but other historians have argued that there is stronger evidence that Byzantine Jews moved directly to Rus. There is no evidence that Jews in Rus were included in the official conversion to Christianity, and they were generally free to live as they wished up until 1495. The Jewish communities of Kiev and Chernihiv corresponded with Babylonian, English and German Jews, and some of their rabbis seem to have visited London. Other Jewish communities appear to have a better chance of some kind of connection with the Khazars. Hungary had well-established ties to Khazaria. You're all familiar by now with the Magyars starting off somewhere in the Urals and making their way gradually west to modern-day Hungary. Jews were established in Hungary from its earliest days, but the contemporary records do not provide clues as to their origins. This has led some scholars to suggest that they were Khazars while others, of course, take the opposite position, asserting that the Jews of Hungary came from German or Slavic territory. Kosler claims that a Jewish merchant named Teka, who became the financial custodian of Hungary and minted coins marked with a Hebrew letter T, was a Khazar, but today it is known that he was actually from Austria. The 
of course, in our day, genetic studies have now overturned much of this speculation, and the actual genetic origins of the Ashkenazi Jews have been well established. Studies have shown that they lack any significant amount of the markers that would link them to a steppe population such as the Khazars, but they are linked to the Middle East and to other Jewish populations. Ashkenazi Jews and Jews from Italy, North Africa, Iraq and Yemen share common Middle Eastern haplogroups, which are also found in Palestinian Arabs, Lebanese and Syrians. Only a very small percentage of Jews have Y-DNA lines, that is the genetic material that is passed down the male line, originating outside of the Middle East. This indicates that the Jewish diaspora did not, as a rule, intermarry with local men, even converts. A study in 2000 concluded, quote, Several lines of evidence support the hypothesis that diaspora Jews from Europe, Northwest Africa, and the Near East resemble each other more closely than they resemble their non-Jewish neighbours. End quote. Subsequent studies examined maternal DNA and found that on the female side, there often was a local component. It seems that many diaspora communities were founded by marriages between men of Judean descent and local converts. The two most prevalent maternal haplogroups in Ashkenazi Jews are still of Middle Eastern origin, but around 21% carry the H haplogroup, which is the most common European haplogroup. A 2006 study by the geneticist Doran Bihar found that 40% of Ashkenazi Jews are descended directly from one of four women. One of these women was definitely of a non-Jewish Middle Eastern origin, but the origin of the other three is debated, with some scholars inclining to the Middle East and others to Southeastern Europe. Later studies have continued to refine the picture, with autosomal DNA studies showing that Ashkenazi Jews are slightly closer to Tuscans, Italians and Southern French than to modern Middle Easterners. They carry between 36 and 55% European autosomal DNA and have a higher genetic diversity than non-Jewish Europeans. What might perhaps be surprising is that only 7% of East European Jews carry any Slavic DNA, and most of that comes from Poles. Only around 2.2% of Ashkenazi DNA could be related to East Asia, which, while much larger than the similar statistic for West European Jews, is still not particularly significant. Hungarians carry a much higher level, for instance. For a comparison, 1.8% comes from sub-Saharan Africa. So a key role for the Khazars would seem to be pretty much ruled out by genetic studies. Geneticists have also conducted specific studies comparing Ashkenazi Jews to other modern populations associated with the Khazars, such as the Volga Tatars, Chuvash and some North Caucasian peoples, as well as Central Asian Turkmen, Uyghurs, Uzbeks, and Tuvans and Siberian peoples. They did not find any sign of common origin. You might remember from previous episodes that there are a couple of other Jewish communities in Eastern Europe, though. So what about them? The Krimchaks were already introduced as one of the Jewish communities of Crimea. Crimea, you'll recall, was partially under Khazar control and partially under Byzantine. In post-Khazar medieval Crimea, the Krimchaks lived in Solpat, now called Stari Krim, or Old Crimea, and Kaffa, which became an Italian colony handling the slave trade and is now called Fiodosia. At some point between the 14th and 16th centuries, Krimchaks adopted Crimean Tatar with a mixture of certain Hebrew words, and they pronounce Hebrew in the Sephardic rather than Ashkenazi manner. Given their location, 
it's also been suggested that the Krimchaks were descendants of the Khazars, but this does not seem to be true. The Krimchaks previously called themselves the Bnei Israel, or Sons of Israel. It is most likely that they are largely descended from Greek Jews, with a significant portion of immigrants from Spain and Italy, as well as some from Persia and Turkey. Although some Ashkenazi family names like Berman, Weinberg or Fischer can be found among them, Mediterranean names like Piastro, Lombroso, Stamboli, Gurgi and Misrahi are more common. Krimchaks lived in most of the towns and cities of Crimea and also moved into cities in nearby regions, forming a large part of the Jewish community in Odessa in Ukraine and in Timiruk and Taman in Russia. Along with the language, the Krimchaks adopted much of Crimean Tatar culture, dressing similarly, eating the same foods, practicing the same folk dances, and building houses in the same style. Crimean Tatar and the Karaim language that was spoken by the Karaite Jews in Lithuania are both members of the Kipchak branch of the Turkic language family. If Khazarian was a branch of Uruk Turkic like the modern Chuvash, as some scholars argue, it would have been very different to any Kipchak language. And even if Khazarian was a common Turkic language, it could still have had substantial differences. In any case, there is no evidence that the Jewish Khazars spoke a language similar to Crimean Tatar. When German forces occupied Crimea in the Second World War, the Krimchaks, led by a man named Isaac Kaya, attempted to avoid being killed by telling the Germans that they were Turkic descendants of the Khazars without any Judean ancestry. Several hundred of them managed to escape and flee the occupied territory before the local Nazis decided that all Jews should be treated the same regardless. Around 90% of the Krimchak population was then murdered by the Nazis and their local collaborators, particularly Crimean Tatars and Armenian nationalists. The Karaites, who I've mentioned previously, as well as in this episode, are a Jewish sect outside of mainstream rabbinical Judaism. They migrated into Eastern Europe from their initial homeland in the Levant and Egypt. The Karaites lived in Crimea and Lithuania, but their earliest settlements date to the end of the 13th century, so a good period of time after the fall of Khazaria. All the evidence is that they arrived in Crimea after rabbinical Jewish communities were already well established, especially in waves of migration from Constantinople after the Turkish conquest. You might be wondering how they got from Crimea to Lithuania. Grand Duke Vitatus, who ruled Lithuania from 1392 to 1430, invited 300 families of Karaites to settle in Troki. In the 19th century, most moved back to Crimea, and the modern Karaite communities in Poland and Lithuania are tiny. The Lithuanian Karaites in particular have been associated with the Khazars, even claiming Khazar descent themselves. A Lithuanian Karaite historian named Ananias Zajetskowski believed that the Khazars had been converted to Judaism by Karaite missionaries a position that was also taken by early Soviet encyclopedias, and believed that the multi-ethnic nature of Khazaria was the reason why the Karaim language contains words derived from Persian and Arabic. Actually, given that the Karaites arrived from the eastern Mediterranean, these words almost certainly predate their migration. There's also a Karaite dessert called Khazar Kalvasi, or Khazar Halva. But this name was actually made up by Shiraya Markovich Shapshal, who was chief rabbi of the Karaites in Troki in the 1930s, and was a supporter of the idea of the Khazar origins of his peoples. These modern proponents of the idea of Khazar origins 
actually went against preceding generations of Karaites, such as Crimean Karaite writer Mordechai Kazas, who wrote, quote, I come from Jews. I am a descendant of Jacob, son of Isaac, who is a son of Abraham. My motherland is called Israel. End quote. A century earlier, as Russia expanded south, the Karaites of Crimea had also written to Catherine II to declare that their ancestors had arrived in Crimea 450 years earlier, but they did not mention the Khazars. If we go even further back, Karaite writers were scathing at the Khazars, calling them illegitimate bastards rather than true Jews, and referring to Khazaria as Ashdod, according to a disparaging verse in Zechariah concerning a land inhabited by bastards. Genetic testing has placed the Crimean Karaites firmly in the Middle Eastern haplogroups that would be expected from what is known of their history, rather than Turkic steppe peoples. Once again, we find no reason to think that the Karaites are actually descended from the Khazars. The last group we will look at is the mountain Jews of Dagestan and Azerbaijan. They speak Juhuri, an Iranic language with a large admixture of Hebrew. In their own dialects, they call themselves Juhuri or Juhuri, while the Russians call them Gorsky Yivri, a direct equivalent of the English term. Kostler thought that mountain Jews also descended from the Khazars. Some scholars have suggested that they were Alans who converted to Judaism. Genetic studies have established that the mountain Jews are actually descended from Persian Jews, who migrated into the Caucasus between the 5th and 18th centuries. However, some scholars believe that the mountain Jews actually did take some elements of their culture from encounters with the Khazars. Mountain Jews use names derived from Jewish festivals, Purim for women and Hanukkah and Pesach for men. We know that the Khazars also used Hanukkah and Pesach as names. They also use Sabriel or Savriel as a family name and Sirach as a female name. Sabriel was the Jewish name of Khan Bulan, the Khazar ruler who led the conversion to Judaism, and Sirach was his wife. This has led some historians to suggest that mountain Jews were a mix of Khazarian and Persian Jews. However, once again, genetic studies have now established that they do not have any Turkic heritage. So although historians in the pre-genetic age have argued many theories for the descent of this or that group of East European Jews from the Khazars, an idea that on its face is quite reasonable and embraced by many Jews themselves at various times. Modern genetic studies have ruled out any connection between the Khazars and modern Jewish groups, whether they speak Yiddish, Slavic, Turkic or any other language. The only evidence we have for a Khazar connection to modern Jewish populations is a few customs surviving among the mountain Jews. But what did happen to the Khazars? It was a major Khan. Millions of people lived there. They didn't just disappear because it was destroyed and the Khan had collapsed. So where did they go? We've already talked a bit about where some of the people of Khazaria went. Some of them went to Volga, Bulgaria, where there were related people. The closeness was probably a part of the reason why they would not have had any reason to maintain a separate identity. It would have been better and easier to assimilate. Others went to Hungary. We already know the Magyars spent a couple of centuries under Khazarian rule and maintained commercial and cultural relations with them after they migrated west. The presence of Khazars in Hungary is well attested. There was an extensive Turkic influence on the Magyars, and which parts of this influence were due to the Khazars and which to other Turkic peoples is impossible to untangle. 
the names of the Magyar tribes were Turkic, and there are hundreds of words in modern Hungarian that have a Turkic origin. Some of them are from the Chuvash branch, and others are from common Turkic. A couple of examples are Alma, or Apple, and Atya, or Father, which you might remember from an early episode, are also the Turkic word that gave us Almatu, the former capital of Kazakhstan and reputed homeland of the Apple. Historians debate whether these words came from Kazarian or elsewhere. Some argue, for instance, that words relating to agriculture and livestock farming were borrowed from the Bulgars. But the Bulgars and the Khazars may have been speaking a very similar language. Hungarian historians attribute the early Hungarian dual kingship system to the Khazars, as well as an influence more generally on their legal system and institutions. Many of the Khazars in Hungary were called Kabars, which historians have interpreted to mean either rebels or mixed blood. The suggestion being that they were either Khazars who had switched allegiance to the Magyars or married into the Magyars and switched allegiance or been forced out by the Khazars for that reason. Constantine Porphyrogenitus mentions them, but merely says that they were of the Khazars' own race. Suvars and Eskil, peoples who we've encountered in Volga, Bulgaria, were also found in Hungary, and other steppe peoples continued to drift into Hungary for several centuries. The 12th century Hungarian king, Bela III, referred to people called the Khazars living in Hungary. There was intermarriage between the early rulers of Hungary and Khazarian nobility, and many Khazars and Kabars served in its armies. Numerous place names around Hungary are believed to refer to the Khazars, such as Khazar, Khorza, Khorzad, Khorzavar, and similar. It may be true that the Khazars ended up in Hungary following the fall of the Khayanat, but there's no trace of them practicing Judaism and they assimilated rather than maintaining a separate identity. And as we've already heard, the modern Jews of Hungary show no descent from the Khazars. Khazars are also believed to have made their way to Romania, where, like Hungary, place names such as Kozavar and Kozard suggest their presence. According to Kosler, there was also a Romanian legend that Jewish warriors from southern Russia invaded and settled in Wallachia and Moldova. Although it's quite possible that Khazars could have moved into this region, we do not have any concrete evidence that they did. The same is true for Lithuania, Belarus and Poland, where similar Khazar-sounding place names can be found. You might be wondering about Khazars in Rus. Khazars had, of course, lived there since before the Scandinavians arrived. There is evidence that they continued to live in Kiev after the Rus took over that at least some portion of the substantial Jewish community that lived in the city by the 10th century was Khazars. We have already referenced the correspondence between the Jewish Khazars in the city and Khazaria in the episodes concerning the Khazars. In the 10th and 11th centuries, workshops in Kiev were producing the same kind of glass beads, bracelets and other jewellery that had previously been produced at Saltiv settlements. This is likely the work of Khazars who had been displaced by the Pechenegs and moved into Rus territory rather than towards the Bulga. As in other parts of Eastern Europe, there are place names surviving in Ukraine and Russia that suggest that Khazars previously lived there, as well as family names that could be derived from Khazar. However, it appears that they largely assimilated to the local population and the Jewish communities of Rus were destroyed in the Mongol conquest. Most of the records of Khazars who left Khazaria show that they went south and east. We know that some Muslim Khazars had already moved from Khazaria to Azerbaijan as early as the mid-9th century. One of the rulers of Azerbaijan, the 9th century Bugar al-Kadir, is even described as a Khazar himself by the Georgian Chronicle. The Khazars of Azerbaijan founded the town of Shamkur on the Kuru River, and after the fall of Itil, 
other refugees likely fled to join them. As Azerbaijanis are also Turkic, although of Orhus origin, the Khazars most likely found it easy to assimilate and soon drop out of the records. Arab writer Ibn Hawkal wrote that some Khazars fled east from the sack of Idil to take refuge on an island in the Caspian named Siakuh. Others went to the estuary of the Terek River or to Baku. Some were forced to accept Islam when they sought refuge among the Arabs. And a large number of Khazarian refugees made their way to Khwarezm, but they also converted to Islam and were again assimilated into the local population. Modern genetic studies have also shown that some Khazars did remain in the North Caucasian part of Khazaria, where they had initially had their capital before the wars with the Arabs. And their descendants can be found in the Karachai and Balkar peoples of Karachai, Cherkessia, and the Kabardina Balkarian Republic. Genetic studies of the Karachais show that they emerged from Iranic peoples mixing with Turkic in the 8th century. So they are most likely related to the Alans and to modern Ossetians, as well as the Khazars. They speak a Kipchak Turkic language related to Tata and Bashkir. After the fall of Khazaria, their ancestors became part of the medieval kingdom of Alania, which was destroyed by Timur or Tamerlane, scattering its population into the Caucasian mountains. Russia annexed the Karachai territory in 1828. In the Second World War, some Karachais collaborated with the German occupiers. Despite thousands more Karachais fighting in the Red Army, once the Soviets had recovered the territory, this led to Stalin deciding the entire nation was traitors and ordering a mass deportation of every Karachai, the first of a series of similar actions against peoples of the Caucasus. With most of the men in the Red Army, this meant that the remaining women, children and elderly were loaded onto cattle cars and shipped by rail to Central Asia, mostly to the Kyrgyz Soviet Socialist Republic. Around 20% died during transit or resettlement, and they were not able to return until after the death of Stalin. The neighbouring kabardina balkarian Republic shares a border with Georgia and contains Elbrus, the highest mountain in Europe. The Balkars share similar Turkic genetic markers to the Karachos, but also have a later contribution from the Kipchak Turks and Cumans. Their territory was also annexed by the Russian Empire. Their territory was annexed by the Russian Empire at the same time as that of the Karachais, and they shared a similar fate. On 8th of March 1944, the entire Balkar population was deported in a single day to destinations in Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Siberia. Like the Karachais, they could not return until nearly 20 years later. Although genetic studies of these peoples show that they are descended from the Khazars, their ethnic identity formed considerably later, and the Khazars are not part of it. It's one of those quirks of history that the people who claim descent from the Khazars actually had no connection to them, or the people who did just forgot about it. I'd like to close this first part by mentioning one more person with a Khazar connection. He was born in the Turkic Orhuz Yagbu state, east of the Caspian, which lay mostly in what is now Kazakhstan. Allegedly the son of a nobleman, he entered service with the Khazars, probably one of the mercenaries the Khans hired from the east. It seems that he converted to Judaism, at least he gave his sons, Mikhail, Yusuf and Yunus, Jewish rather than Turkic names. Near contemporary Muslim writers say that he was a commander in the Khazar army. He may have remained on their side when his Oghuz compatriots went to war with Khazaria. In any case, after the destruction of Itil, 
some incident occurred that led to him and one hundred horsemen under his command, fleeing into the steppe, where his men and their families took up residence in the Sirdaria, in the town of Jand, and converted to Islam. It seems plausible that this could have been due to him picking the losing side. He expelled the Orhus Yagbul officials from Jand and began gathering power. He passed command of his armies to his sons, who successfully continued to expand their territory. From his sons, power passed to his grandson, Tuhril, who established an empire from the Hindu Kush to Anatolia that bore his name, Seljuk. Join me next episode for Imaginary Khazars Part 2, Gumilyov's Chimera, as we look at the Khazar connection to Vladimir Putin's favorite theory of ethnicity. Thank you for listening, and until next time, goodbye.